uh, coming to Atlanta and leading the work of Atlanta Legal at a time when the Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing our CEO in a second, uh, who is going to discuss some queer history. Because the idea with this exhibit is to explore the past, figure out where we are situated in the present, and figure out how we can strategically move into the future. And so we're starting with this history. And then we're lucky enough to talk about one of our uh, not too distant uh, wins with our Lawrence v. Texas case that we won at the Supreme Court. We're really lucky uh, to have a, a panel facilitated and hosted by Eric Paul, who is one of our Tyrone and Garner uh, Memorial Fellows, legal fellows. Um, and so we're really excited about that partnership. So Eric, thank you for being here. So then, our good friends at Georgia Equality are jumping in uh, and, and have invited some of our local political leaders uh, and lobbyists to come in and talk about what the heck is going to happen under the gold dome coming up starting next week. And it's not going to be pretty. But here's the thing. In just a moment, Kevin, our CEO, is going to tell you a little bit of history. 
It may make you feel a little better about what's going to happen next week under the Gold Dome. It may, help, may make you feel a little worse. I don't know. But this is not our first time to the rodeo. Land and Legal's been doing this for 50 years. Our movement, people in this country and around the world have been doing it longer than that. And that's why we're really lucky and that's why we're grateful that you're here today. So with, uh, with no, more, uh, no more talking from me, I would like to introduce uh, Land and Legal's CEO, Kevin Jennings. Uh, Kevin has been with Land and Legal since 2019. I always joke that I am a senior because I started two weeks before he did. <laughs> Um, Kevin has a storied history in our movement. He, uh, as a high school teacher, founded the first Gay Straight Alliance in the country and then went on to lead, found and lead Glisten. He then, through his history, worked for, uh, what was that guy's name? Oh, that's right, President Obama as the Assistant Secretary of Education. Um, and you know, we're in a museum today, and so it's uh, it's nice to know that Kevin has some history with museums because before they were legal, um, he was at the Tenement Museum as the CEO uh, in New York. And so he has this very amazing history, and this is why, as a history teacher, he's going to school us all right now talking about our queer heroes. So, Kevin, please take it off. Take it off. Take it away. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. First of all, how many people think Tim and should leave the museum and do radio announcing? <laughs> I, I think you've missed it all. Um, I want to start by recognizing some of my colleagues that work at Land Legal. Like I saw Percy just sat down. So now I'm going to make you all stand up again. Percy, Greta, Greta, please stand up. We've been in the land since 1997. We're very proud of that. Um, and um, we will stay here as long as the fight continues, which unfortunately does not look like it's going to end anytime soon. Now, I started my career ooh, 39 years ago as a high school history teacher. And you can take the teacher out of the classroom, but you cannot take the classroom out of the teacher. So we're going to have a little history lesson today. And in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to cover all of LGBT history. <laughs> Thank you. That was meant to be a last line because it's absurd that they got to cover all of that history in 30 minutes. But I'm going to be talking really fast. Now, I grew up in a little town called Louisville, North Carolina, where people always said to me as a kid, boy, you talk too fast. So I now live in New York. I am not scared of snow, so I'm still here. Um, and I'm going to be talking really, really, really fast. But that's okay because we'll have time to get for questions. But I'd like to have you, I'm going to do a little poll at the end. So let me tell you what the poll is going to be so you can be thinking about it. Did you know a little of this content, some of this content, or a lot of this content? I'm going to ask at the end where you work. And there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious to always know. All right? So if there's one Thing. You know, I'm very aware, having been a teacher, the kids we had 99% of what you said. But if there's one thing I hope you will remember from today's little talk, it's this. LGBTQ plus people are not the newcomers to the North American continent. Bigotry against LGBTQ plus people is the newcomer to the North American continent. And we know this because we know among indigenous people, there was a tradition of what we call two-spirit people. And one thing that we know about very specifically in history is this person, Lewa, who was a member of the Zuni tribal community in what is now New Mexico in the 1800s. Now, if we were trying to slap modern terminology on Lewa, who was assigned male at birth but lived in a different gender identity, today we might say trans or non-binary, but you know, that, those were words that Wewa did not know. Um, so it's always tricky to slap modern terminology on people. But Wewa was a person that lived outside the gender binary. Now, among Native people, the fact that someone had been given a special vision, someone had two spirits, was considered a gift. 
and they were respected and esteemed and considered to have been given a special designation by the spirit world because they had two spirits. So, when the Zuni had to negotiate a new treaty with the U.S. government in the 1880s, they put together a delegation of their leading citizens, and they sent them to Washington. And one of them was Waywa. And this is a picture taken of Waywa when she was in Washington in 1888. Now, I think this is a really fascinating historical moment. And the reason is this. You're all aware because you're all LGBTQ plus uh, activists and allies. Violence against trans people in America today is so bad the American Medical Association has deemed it a public health emergency. Yet among indigenous communities, people that we would today label as trans were so respected that they were sent on the most important mission that the tribe had. Now the question of course is why did this change? Uh, and I facetiously sometimes say white people. Um, but I'm not entirely facetious, because it was the coming of European settlers who brought very different attitudes about gender and sexuality to the North American continent. And this is the first capital crimes code in British North America, in Massachusetts in 1642. Capital crimes are those who want you to be put to death, as you know. 15 capital crimes, nine of them deal with sex. So the Puritans were a little obsessed with the sex, uh, the most relevant one for us, which may be hard to read because it's an old document, is number eight. If a man lies with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed abomination, they both shall surely be put to death. This is the forerunner of what we call sodomy laws, which we're going to discuss in the next panel, which would remain on the books in America in 16 states until the 21st century. So, if there's one thing to know about LGBTQ plus people, though, is that we are a resilient bunch. And despite the fact that it was illegal to be LGBTQ plus, that beginning in the 1800s it was deemed to be a mental illness for which you could be put in institutions against your will, people found a way to form community. And an example of this is this map, which is a map of Harlem in the 1930s, which shows the number of establishments that specifically cater to black lesbians. And you can see how many orange squares there are all over this map. So even at a time when it was literally illegal to be who we were, we found a way to create a community. Now in the UK, okay, we're gonna, this is the MacGyver moment. Um, LGBTQ plus people actually invented their own language, which they could speak in front of straight people, and straight people would not understand were saying. This, uh, I'm going to show you about a 60 second film clip in this language. See if you can follow what we're talking about. Let's see if it works. Yeah, you got mad myself the other week. I just finished breaking this chicken in the cottage age axe placket lane. You know what? Anyway, I'm mincing outside, wiping the screen. And who should I bump into? But one of your ugly daughters. There's a booth in there, I said. Back in the biggest cafes down, I suppose. She didn't have a bump in coming. Must have been a right fair Cadooza. Charlotte. You're disgusting. What? Oh, go on. Put your fake lens in your little shush bag off your scarf. Huh? You forgot your glossy. Completely unintelligible, right? And that is the point of the language, so that LGBTQ plus people could talk without straight people understanding what they were saying. What he's actually describing was a very common phenomenon, which continues today in LGBTQ plus experience, which is police harassment. He's talking about the fact that he was in a public restroom, but the police came in, tried to arrest him, and he said, I'm not gay, that guy is. There's a proof over there. And the other man is so disgusted that he threw the other gay person under the bus that he storms off. But that's what the dialogue actually means. And I think it's a testament to the creativity and resilience of LGBTQ plus people that we were able to invent even our own language. So that we can talk. Now, let's see. 
This all began to change in the late 1800s, the early 1900s. Henry Gerber was a German immigrant to the United States who was sent to Germany after World War I as part of the Occupied Army. When he was in Germany, you learned about the work of a man named Matthias Hirschfeld, who had created the first LGBTQ plus rights organization in American in world history in 1897 in Berlin called the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. And Gerber thought, well, if they can do that in Germany, we can do this in America. So in 1924, he came back to America and he created the first LGBTQ plus rights group in America called the Society for Human Rights, which was incorporated in the city of Chicago on December 10th, 1924. Now, you maybe have never heard of Society for Human Rights, and there's a good reason. And it goes back to what we just talked about, police harassment. When the police found out about the society, which was illegal because, remember, there's still sodomy laws, they arrested Gruber and the other incorporators, and they broke the society up. And the people who were arrested were so traumatized by it that they never tried to reform the society. But for people who want to tell you that the LGBTQ plus rights movement is something new, we've been here in this country for 100 years. Now, the real event in the 20th century, though, that really started to change things for LGBTQ plus people was World War II. You have to remember in 1941, 60% of Americans lived in towns of 10,000 or fewer. If you were an LGBTQ plus person growing up in such a community, you probably felt pretty isolated and pretty alone. Then we mobilized millions of people to go fight the war into racially and sexually segregated units. Units of black men, white men, white women, black women. And guess what people find in those units? Other people like themselves. And they start forming a sense of consciousness and community. And when they get off those ships at the end of the war, they have to decide, am I going back to Louisville, North Carolina, or am I staying here in New York, or San Francisco, or any other big city? They stay in the big cities. And that led to the explosion in the size of LGBTQ plus communities in the post-war era, which leads us to law one of LGBTQ plus history. The more visible we are, the more we get attacked. So as these communities became more visible, the extreme right became more and more disturbed. And they decided that perverts, as they referred to LGBTQ plus people, were a national security threat. And they launched investigations into the perverts running the American government. We probably all studied in school the Red Scare, which was when there were uh, witch hunts for supposed communists in the government. What's less known is the Lavender Scare. In 1953, one of his first acts as president, President Eisenhower signed Executive Order 104500, which banned the employment of known perverts by the federal government or by federal contractors. By the way, elements of this would remain in force until President Clinton revealed it in 1996. So it remained on the books for 43 years. Now, over 5,000 people that we know of were purged from the government as a result of the Lavender Scare, far more than communists. Yet to this day, the Lavender Scare is absent from that. Now, if law one is the more we are visible, the more we are attacked, law two is this. The more we are attacked, the more we fight back. An example of that are these two women, Phyllis Martin and Del Meyer. I'm oh, sorry, Phyllis Martin and Del Martin. They lived in San Francisco, where in 1955, they created the first lesbian rights organization in American history, the Daughters of Alliance. Now, you have to think about the courage it took to start a lesbian rights organization in 1955. In a country where it was still illegal to be gay, in a country where you could be put in a middle institution against your consent, in a country where you could be fired from your job and have your years. Yet these women had the courage to start an organization in 1955. And they come back with the slideshow. Also in San Francisco was this person, Jose Sadia. Jose Sadia was a drag performer, and they saw what was happening in the bars in which they performed. The police would come into the bars, they would rough the patrons up, they would extort the patrons for money, and there were nothing the patrons could do about it. Once again, with the police harassment, which was a common LGBTQ plus experience. And Jose Sadia got tired of it. So in 19, 61, they did something that no one had ever done before in 
before in American history. They ran for public office as an adult. That was unique to females personally. Now, you probably have heard of somebody named Harvey Milk, who 16 years later would win the same office that Jose Sadio ran for. And he's a great historical figure, but it's important to realize that he was beaten to the punch by 16 years by a Latino director. So, as everybody who's watched the movie now knows, I used to tell this story, nobody knew the story, but hopefully you've all seen the movie. Uh, in the 1950s, Byron Rustin was a major leader in the uh, Black Civil Rights Movement. He had actually led the first freedom rides through the South in the 1940s and was arrested with his partner in North Carolina in 1946 or so doing. He was a key advisor to Martin Luther King, and uh, Martin Luther King asked him to organize the March on Washington, where Martin Luther King gave the famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Now, as we also know, uh, Byron West was frequently purged from jobs in the movement that were discriminated against because he was an overly gay man. But what's been forgotten from history, everybody, of course, remembers the incredible I Have a Dream speech, the last speaker of the day. What has been forgotten is that the first speaker of the day was an openly gay black man, Brian Russell. Now, <coughs> the early LGBT plus rights activists watched people like Russell and King, and they learned. And what they learned was that being polite was not going to get you anywhere, that you had to demand change. One of those was the second man in his picket line, like Betty Craig Campbell. Frank Camby was a government scientist who was fired from his job because of lavender spear. He went to court, he pursued all the way to the Supreme Court, and refused to hear his case. So, having no other alternative, in, on April 14, 1965, he organized the first picket of the White House for LGBTQ plus rights. And it's very interesting when you look at how they're dressed. Frank Camby had a very specific philosophy. He said, if you want to be employed, you have to look employed. So he made everybody wear a suit, and he made women wear skirts and pumps. Some of the women in the literally said they had never worn skirts and pumps before in their lives, but they did it because Frank told them to. Uh, and this is actually a really interesting slide to remember when we look at the later LGBTQ plus rights movement. Um, one of the women who worked with Frank was this woman, Barbara Gibbons, who beginning in 1966 organized a thing called the Annual Reminder, which was a march outside of uh, Independence Hall in Philadelphia on July 4th, where she lived, to protest the fact that not all Americans yet have their civil rights. So, this brings us up to the late 60s. And as you know, the late 60s was a time of tremendous tumult and change in this country. And the LGBTQ plus community was no stranger to that. In 1969, the police came into a bar in New York and they began to rub the papers up, like the newsroom did. They've been doing this for decades. Something clicked that night, though, and the patrons fought back. Now, that bar was called the Stills Bar. And you probably, if you know nothing else about the TV plus history, you know that story. The fact that on the night of June 28, 1969, the patrons fought back. Here are the patrons outside the bar after they went to the bar. And this marked a real turning point in LGBTQ plus history. Let's go back for a second. Look how polite and nice these people. Right? <laughs> These people are like, screw you. We're going to be ourselves. We're going to live the way we want, and you can get used to it. And they were led by trans women of color like Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, two women in this photo who would go on without the first trans rights organization in America in 1970. And that new philosophy became known as gay liberation. That instead of trying to show that we could be like everybody else, we would liberate ourselves from society's oppressive norms. Now, gay liberation in the 1970s led to a massive explosion in activity and progress for the community, like the founding of Planned Parenthood in 1973, and the passage of the first state law protecting people from discrimination based on sexual orientation in 1982. Lawyers not about the answer. Non-lawyers, pop quiz. What state was it? Do I want to guess? <laughs> <laughs> okay, lawyers. Any of the lawyers know? Greg? Wisconsin. 
Wisconsin, Greg wins. The cheese eggs were the first to ban discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in this country. Now remember though, law one is the more visible we more we are attacked, right? In the late 70s, there was Anita Bryant and the Save Our Children movement, and the backlash began. And in the middle of that backlash, this happened. July 5th, 1981. New York Times reports on a strange new disease that's killing young gay men. At first, they start calling it gay cancer because this cancer is assaulting these threatening young gay men. Then they begin to realize that these young men were dying of other strange diseases. You don't usually die after your 20s and 30s. So they changed the name of the disease to GRIP, gay related immune deficiency. And then they begin to realize other people were dying from this strange uh, syndrome. And they changed it to the thing that we know it as today, AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. As everyone in my age bracket or well in this room knows, AIDS was devastating our community. Over half a million gay men would die of the disease in the next 15 years. In New York City alone, more gay men died of AIDS between 1981 and 1995, the whole number of Americans who died in the year. This is not a distraction to me. The first guy in Ada died. My college roommate died. My master of college died. I watched my generation from my own time. Now, you remember the law too. The more we are attacked, the more we fight back. And that took the form of organizations like Land of Legal, which in 1983 bought the first lawsuit protecting people from discrimination on the basis of their viral status, and we won. People versus West Coast Tenant Court. This man, Dr. Richard Sonnenbeck, was the doctor who was evicted from his office because he treated people with AIDS. And 41 years ago, we established a precedent that you cannot discriminate against people based on HIV status. Other people took to the streets, like this man, Larry Kramer. Larry Kramer uh, believed that only direct action would change the course of the epidemic. And with artists, they coined the term silence equals death, and they turned the theme triangle, which had been used to designate homosexual prisoners in Nazi concentration camps, upside down, to say, this time we will not go silent. And they took to the streets, and they did things like block the uh, Food and Drug Administration headquarters in Washington, took over the stock exchange, at the opening bell, in an action I was arrested for, blocked the Brooklyn Bridge at rush hour, and we forced the government to do something about the AIDS. Remember, in the 80s, the government did nothing. For six years, President Reagan did not say the word AIDS in public. His press secretary said into a live mic, what is the miracle of AIDS in terms of fruits and vegetables? That was what we took out of the 80s, but we forced the government to take action and there became treatments available for AIDS by the late 90s that turned it into a chronic illness. I don't want to make it sound like this problem has gone away. We are right now here in DeKalb County representing Isaiah Wilkins, a young man who was expelled from the military because of his HIV status. Believe it or not, 40 years of the epidemic, you still cannot enlist in the American military if you're HIV positive. So there's still fighting to be done. But what happened in the late 90s was, if you had medical insurance, and if you had access to treatments, it became a chronic disease rather than a death sentence. And with that, um, the movement began to move beyond a uh, agenda of simply trying to stay alive to trying to attack the broader range of problems that we faced. I, at the time, was a high school teacher in um, Concord, Massachusetts. And, um, in November 10th, 1988, I decided, well, I'll tell you the back story, a little bit of a personal story here. I was fired from my first teaching job in Concord, Rhode Island, as I was here. I went to my second job in Concord, and I was very nervous about kids finding out that I was gay, because I was like, you know, I lost my job. Um, and I have news for any LGBTQ plus teachers you know. Kids always know who the gay teacher is. <laughs> they always know. They always know. And sure enough, a young man figured it out, uh, and he came to me and he came out to me. And then he said something that changed the course of my life, that he was thinking of killing himself. Now, when I was a kid in Louisville, North Carolina, when I was 16, I had tried to kill myself. 
but I have no training in what to do. So I said, let's go see a school counselor. And he said, why shouldn't I kill myself? My life isn't worth saving anyway. And I made a promise to myself that whatever I did with the rest of my life, I would try to make sure the next generation of LGBTQ plus kids did not grow up feeling that their lives were not worth saving. So a few weeks later, on November 10th, 1988, I got up at the school assembly and I came out the entire school. 1988 was a different time now. Uh, as we know, Wisconsin was the only state that protected us. Uh, people were dying of AIDS by the tens of thousands. Ronald Reagan was president. So it was very unusual <laughs> to be an out LGBTQ in 1988. But what was even more unusual was what happened the next day. This um, ninth grade girl came to me and said, bursts into my office and says, I want to start a club to find homophobia. I'm like, hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> Um, and I'm like, okay, now I didn't know much about this girl except she was the hot freshman girl who had the hot senior boyfriend who was always making out the whole thing. Uh, so I thought she probably not a lesbian. Um, so I was curious, I said, tell me why you care so much about this cause. And she said, oh, that's easy. My mother's a lesbian and I'm tired of hearing my family get put down by this school. Naive 24 year old me never thought about the fact that I have kids who have nothing to do with them. So I said, well, what do you want to call this club? And she said, I don't know, you're gay and I'm straight. Let's call it gay straight lines. <laughs> and that was the first GSA in America. Um, and they now exist in over half of all American high school, which I'm very happy to say. This is a much younger me in a glistened t-shirt. Actually, it's a 31 year old picture. This is what age does, kids. With um, <laughs> some of the kids from that GSA. Um, happy ending to the story. The boy uh, is now 52, lives in Brooklyn where he and his husband are renovating a brownstone. How gay is that? <laughs> um, the girl, Meredith, lives in Boston where she's married to a man. She has two kids. We know that out for coffee a little while back and her lesbian mother beat us out. So everybody got a happy ending out of the story. Now, as we're about to hear some great depth, I'm not going to go into much detail about this. In 2003, Land Legal represented these two men, Tyro Gardner and John Lawrence, who had been arrested in Houston, Texas for uh, their same-sex activity, and we went to the Supreme Court and we won. And the sodomy laws, which have been on the books in this country since 1642, finally were invalidated. Now, it's important to remember for younger people, this is the 21st century we're talking about. This is not ancient history. In this century, there were still laws and books that criminalized us in 16 states. The year 2003, these two women, Hillary and Julie Cookers, decided to start suing the state of Massachusetts because they were denied a marriage license, and they won. And in January 1st, 2004, Massachusetts became the first state to grant marriage equality in American history. In 2004, the mayor of San Francisco, Gavin Newsom, decided he was just going to start handing out marriage licenses. He didn't give a crap what the law said. Um, but he said, first, people to get married have to be <laughs> Del Martin and Bill Schwartz, who were still alone 40 years after founding the Daughters of the Lions. Sorry, 50 years after founding the Daughters of the Lions. And this is Phyllis and Del with Mayor, Mayor Newsom, now Governor Newsom, performing their wedding ceremony. Del would die a few months later. Phyllis lived until 2020. As you know, in 2015, Land of Legal's co counsel on the case that made marriage equality go to law. Remember Frank Kameny, the guy who picketed the White House in 1965? Well, here he is inside the White House. In 2011, President Obama has just signed an executive order for marriage equality granting same-sex couples that work for the federal government the same benefits as opposite-sex couples, and he wanted Frank Cameron to be by his side when he signed the executive order. Frank would have died that year on October 11th, which, as you probably know, is National Coming Out Day. The man who coined the term gay is good, poetically, would die on National Coming Out Day. Now, I've been telling you, we can stop at this point and get a happy ending, right? Probably this is not 
As you probably know, in 2022, 283 anti-LGBTQ plus bills were introduced in America. In, actually, I need to update this number because last year was 567. The number doubled in one year. And I don't know how many people were here last night, but um, as of January 5th, which is yesterday, we've been in legislative session for one week in this country, 125 anti-trans bills have already been introduced. So it's going to be even worse this year. And don't think it is restricted. I have to update this map too, because Wisconsin introduced one as well now. There are only three states that have not considered such a bill. Delaware, Illinois, and New York. 47 states have had such bills in their state legislatures. So I know it's a tough fight in Georgia. The good or bad news is you are not loved. We are fighting this fight across the country. Now, Lend Legal is fighting back. We are litigating. 29 states across the country, and one of our partners in the ACLU, we are actively challenging these new laws. Now, if you look abroad, the picture is still pretty grim. If you live in one of the red countries, there are still some of the sodomy laws on the books, which criminalize same sex relationships. If you live in one of the countries that was just shaded black, it's still a capital crime, and you can still be executed. So we have a lot of work to do. That's no news to anybody in this room. But it is not an entirely happy ending. The great thing about land illegal is we've won a lot of rights through litigation. The bad thing about land illegal is the litigation is really good. So we have got to keep fighting. And if it takes another 50 years, we will. But I do want to close with a hopeful story. And it's about this woman, Amy Stevens. The woman on the left is Land Legal's legal director, Sharon McCall. This picture was taken October 8, 2019. Amy Stevens worked at a funeral home in Michigan where she was fired from her job after she announced that she was trans. So she did, remember number one, the more visible we are, the more we are attacked. That's what happened to Amy. Remember number two, the more we are attacked, the more we fight back. That's what Amy did. Amy went to court. And thanks to precedents that I saw Mandy out there talking. By people like Mandy Beth Glenn, who um, won here in Georgia. There were precedents that had been won by people like Greg Nevins, who made hand, Greg, um, that Amy could build on. She took her case all the way to the Supreme Court. It was the uh, consolidated with another case from Georgia, Bostock versus Franklin County. And it was the first case about whether or not people could be discriminated against based on gender identity never heard of the Supreme Court. On October 8, 2019. And everybody in Georgia knows the result. In June 2020, in Bostock versus Clayton County, the court ruled that you could not fire people from their jobs based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And the same government in 1953 said you couldn't hire an LGBTQ plus person, came on record and said you couldn't fire an LGBTQ plus person. Now there's only one sad part to my story. Amy Stevens didn't live to see that day. Amy died in May of 2020. Now, I'm not telling you that to bring you down. I'm telling you that so that we recognize the debt we owe to the people who paved the way for us to be here today. People like Jose Sano, Fire Russell, Amy Stevens, Marshall P. Johnson. Sylvia Rivera, Frank Kennedy, Barbara Gibbons, Henry Gilbert, Larry Kramer. Folks who in, frankly, scarier times than ours, stood up and fought back. They have passed the baton to us, and now it is our turn. And when I toured the museum with our board about a year and a half ago, there was a quote from Brother Scott King which has stuck with me. She said, freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. We are so blessed to have had that history of incredible people who earned and won freedoms for us that they themselves never enjoyed. We now owe it to the next generation to make them freer than we are. That's our job today. That's our job tomorrow. That's our job today. So, thank you. Appreciate everybody listening.
Okay, first of all, let's do my little poll. How many of you do most of that? Raise your hand. That is definitely raise your hands. Uh, <laughs> all right, how many of you do some of that? How many of you do only a little of that? That's interesting. So that's the best I've ever had an audience do. Normally, it's overwhelmingly a little of that. In fact, I'm, I'm not going to name the firm because I don't want to embarrass them. But I was invited to speak at a firm. I said, well, I have this talk I do. And they were like, oh, I'm on this know all that. Did you make this talk? I said, sure, we'll do career history jeopardy. So I turned everything you just saw on that slideshow into a game show. They got one question. <laughs> <laughs> so even people working in prestigious law firms don't know this legal history. Um, can, can I do it tonight? Yeah, I tell a quick history story before we finish. Sure, don't This is a Frank Kennedy story. So, some of you may know, uh, I was the founding director of the LGBT Center at the University of Georgia. Anybody affiliated, graduated the University of Georgia? Have you heard of this school before? <laughs> <laughs> so, we opened the LGBT Center in 2005. One of the things that I discovered um, was that the first LGBTQ student group at UGA was founded in what year? What do you think? 73. 71. Usually people say 2003, 2005, no, 1971. And it was founded by two folks that uh, did a program at Bromley Hall on campus. Um, and they decided to found this, the, the Gay Education, uh, the, yeah, the Committee on Gay Education. So anyway, they decided that spring to hold a dance in Memorial Hall. And the university stopped. And they ended up suing and waiting to be able to have that dance. They sued again that year in 1972 uh, to have a conference <coughs> on campus. But here's the tie into Frank Kennedy. We were going through news articles from the Red and Black newspaper, and Frank Kennedy wrote an op ed into the Red and Black in 1972. And he, he identified as the unofficial advisor to the Committee on the Education of the University of Georgia. And he said, to the University of Georgia, I want to tell you, if you are going to stop, and this was the reason they told the students they couldn't have the dance. They said, if they had the dance in Georgia, that the university would be aiding and abetting sodomy. Okay. So Frank wrote a letter in, and he said, if you are going to cancel a homosexual dance because you're aiding and abetting sodomy, I would like to point out that fornication is on the books in Georgia. And fornication is more likely at a heterosexual dance than a sodomy act at a homosexual act. So we must cancel all dances uh, at the university. And so fast forward, right before Frank uh, passed away, um, I had an opportunity to meet him. And I asked him if he had remembered uh, writing this. He's like, well, I've written a lot of letters. <laughs> he said, unfortunately, no. The interesting thing was he had just had his house put on the list of historic markers, or uh, registered on the historic places in Washington, D.C. His protest signs were just put into the Smithsonian, and Barack Obama had just written a letter of apology to him uh, for him being fired. And I asked him the question, I said, so Frank, you know, what do you think about getting this letter from the president. And I have to channel Frank. If anybody's ever heard Frank speak before, he has a very distinct voice. And he said, well, I wrote back. <laughs> I said, so what did you do, Frank? He said, well, I said, I assume I am going to return to my job, and there's going to be back pay. <laughs> and I said, have you heard anything back? He goes, not yet. <laughs> so anyway, and Frank went on just right after that to, to pass away. But one of the things that I want to point out with that is that Frank Kameny wasn't someone that just, that that he was walking in the shoes that we're walking in. Barbara Giddings was walking in the shoes. Kevin was just teaching some classes, right? And so as we see all of these people up here and we see how extraordinary they are, we have to remember that we are all extraordinary in this work, and we can do all of these things. So, sorry, I wanted to take that. Well, that's great. Now we can take questions. Okay, now we're going to stop. Any questions, comments, thoughts?
Yes. We had student diverse into your office to start the GSA. What did you have backlash? Were there other repercussions for coming out to the school? As I have seen happen school after school after school <coughs> over the last 36, 36 years, um, the administration was freaked out, the kids were fucked. That is always the way it works. Always the way it works. Um, what's funny is the school had me back in whatever year it was, 2018, to do a 30th celebration of the founding of the GSA. Now they brag about the fact that they had the first GSA. Um, but at the time, they were not happy, let me tell you. Um, so the, the kids were great. Um, in fact, I'll tell you another funny story. Um, two kids, Liz Wong and Tom Darwin, met in my class uh, when I was teaching. And uh, they started dating. They were freshmen. Uh, I kept in touch with them after they went to college and everything. So like 10 years later, they called me up and they're like, Kevin, we got news for you. I'm like, let me guess, you've been dating for 10 years, you're getting married. And they're like, yeah, that's not the news though. I'm like, uh, so um, I'm like, okay, all right, what's the news? They're like, you know, Tom really doesn't want a minister in our wedding, uh, and we wanted somebody who symbolized the importance of love to our marriage, and would you uh, issue our wedding? So here are these two young straight kids pick me to officiate their wedding. Um, and um, I'm still in touch with them. They're now in their late 40s. They have four kids. Um, but that was one of the most touching things was that where these two young straight people thought who symbolizes the importance of love to them, they thought it would be them. Other questions? Yeah. So I'm, I'm one of the non lawyers in the room. <laughs> Me too, I have to come out. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been together for 31 years, and um, some of you all sort of the old people are there, and we met. And knowing that heterosexuals can commit some. Was that anyone ever thought the, the fact that heterosexuals were committing sodomy is, or was it only selectively done against homosexuals? Well, I'm going to let the lawyer speak to this in the Lawrence versus Texas panel. The short answer is yes. Um, it's the short answer. Uh, wait, there's something else you said that the age 100 would be 160. I think so. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, sorry, I can't remember the other response. But, uh, oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, I actually had to correct my um, terminology in this lecture recently. Because I said, you know, zombie laws are still on the books. Zombie laws are still on the books. They've just been invalidated. They're still on the books, 16 states. The issue right now is um, Mr. Mitchell in Texas, the former Solicitor General who wrote the Texas abortion ban as the panel of Dowdler discussed with you, has already announced that his next goal is to overthrow the legislature of Texas. So we could, if we have bad luck at the Supreme Court, go back into a situation where we have 16 states of sodomy laws again because they weren't taken off the books, they were just invalid. <coughs> Excuse me, that would be the whole Other questions? Yes. Next yeah, I would like to ask. Uh, Michael, I, I want to thank you for inspiring everyone in this room that we are all change makers because I really feel that. But Kevin, you shared the story about young men, how when he came to you and said that he was he was considering taking his life because he couldn't do his authentic self. I know what that made you do, but how did it make you feel? Oh. Great question, Gabriel. Um, the reason I ask that question, Gabriel, is because I think a lot of times we just don't understand the power of our own visibility yeah. and how it impacts the people around us. You have no clue about what your ripple looks like, right? And so I would like to ask you, how did that, if you could be vulnerable and I'd be sure of this, how did that make you feel? Really? God, uh, honest answer? I thought it was shame for myself. Because here I was, staying in the closet, helping teach this young man that being LGBTQ plus is something you should be ashamed of. Uh, and I was part of the problem by not being honest myself. And that's why I said I had to come out. 
is I thought, you know, I am part of the problem here by not being honest about who I am. And, you know, quite honestly, I'm thinking $12,000 a year. Um, <laughs> I was like, if I get fired, I'm going to work at McDonald's probably in that much. My mother supported our family more than working at McDonald's. Um, so it wasn't the money, it was um, I was privileging my own comfort. Does that make sense? Um, and Brewster, that's his name, who I'm still friends with, as I mentioned, shamed me out of doing that before. And I realized I had to tell the truth that I had to be visible because I was part of the system that was teaching me to be ashamed of myself. Right. Yes. Um, thank you so much for sharing this history. This is not the history of the course I learned in the classroom, so I'm very grateful for it. But I did know a little bit about it just because of my research. I'm curious. Um, do you, we, we have met as part of space laws across the country, unfortunately. There's a lot of focus on education. And <coughs> history, some of it um, maybe some people uncomfortable. I'm curious if there is an interest in sharing history as a curriculum, um, and if that is something that is being worked on. Yeah, first of all, can I? Do a little soliloquy on this for a second because this is um, the number one way throughout history dominant cultures have chosen to persecute disenfranchised people. The number one and most effective canard is to say they're bad for your kids. Supposedly the Jews drank the blood of Christian children that justified pogroms. Supposedly black men were after little white girls, and that justified lynching. Supposedly the Roma, who pejoratively are called gypsies, stole children in Europe, and that justified putting them in concentration camps. And supposedly LGBTQ plus people were recruit or groomed, is the words we're using now. You know, this has been done to every disenfranchised group in history for a very simple reason. It works. I don't know how many of you groomed our parents. But I'm sure you will agree with me that if you thought somebody was going to hurt your kid, you'd get your national print play. And so there's a reason why our opponents have focused in on this event. And they're taking advantage of the fact that over 70% of Americans think they've never met a trans person. They have, they just don't know it. But they think they don't know anyone who's trans. So they're picking on, you notice all these anti trans bills generally pertain to you. Because they're playing on that trope that they're after your kids. And it works. Uh, and that's why they're doing it. There's a second reason they're doing it. And I talked about this last night, so if I'm being repetitive, I apologize. When I was a teacher, I used to start my class with the Orwell quote those who control the present control the past, those who control the past control the future. And there's a reason why they are trying so hard to pass don't say gay or trans bills, so they can erase us of the past. They're passing laws that they are the supposed to teach you critical race theory because they don't want people to know the truth of this country's history around this. They want a sanitized past because then they can have their version of a sanitized future. So, um, and I'm, I'm warning everyone in the country, this is the next wave. Last year in 23, 22, sorry, uh, Georgia, uh, Florida passed its don't say gay or trans law. There are now six states, including my home state of North Carolina, that have such a law. Um, and I guarantee you that they will be introducing it into multiple more states this year. This is their next wave of that law. Um, we are not standing for it. We, Iowa was one of the states that passed such a law last year. Uh, it was supposed to go into effect on January 1st. I specifically got to block it in court. Um, you know, we will go to court, we will challenge these laws as often as we have to. Um, but make no mistake about it, they're playing on that trope that we're after the kids, and they are trying to erase the history so they can erase us from the future. This is a very well thought out strategy. Another question. Thank you. 
actually stay on time. It's a miracle. And the LGBT event, we're going to be like, oh. Um, so thank you all uh, so much for being here today. Thank you for being people making history today. You, you probably don't think about it, but 50 years from now, people will be saying, you know, there was this group in Georgia. And it was a dark and scary time. And people stood up and fought back. You're those people. You're the people people are talking about. So thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Kevin. Um, Kevin's not going to be able to stay around to the very end uh, because he is also going to try to get on the plane to go back to New York. Um, but Kevin, thank you so much um, for being here. Um, we could take a couple of minutes if you need to refresh or get some treats. The restrooms are right around the corner. Uh, we'll reconvene in about five minutes, and I'm going to have uh, Tim and Eric and Greg come up, and we'll get started with our morning panel. Uh, feel free to change seats. And here's my challenge. If you spot someone in the room who you don't know, you need to go over to them and say, Michael told me to do this. Hi, my name is, my pronouns are, please tell me your story. So go forth and meet new friends. And if
please come on back. So let's, while we're getting settled back down, let's give a round of applause to our the beautiful catering folk who are Um, also, uh, to Russ, who is our fabulous photographer, um, if you want to have some pretty pictures taken of yourself uh, and, and strike a pose, um, we'll be putting these on our Facebook page, and we can also email them to you. So if you if you want a pretty picture of yourself, Russ is the person to do it. So just flag Russ down there and Russ down there in the break uh, and make that happen. So thank you for being here. Um, all right, we are about ready to shift our gears. Um, so we went sort of in the deep past uh, in some of our history, and now we're going to come back to about 20 years ago uh, when the Supreme Court ruled on the Board of East Texas. Um, I am really excited to have some of our, uh, to have all of our panelists up here today. Uh, obviously, you have met the fabulous Tim and West, uh, the executive director of the LGBTQ Institute at the National Center for Civil Human Rights. Um, and I'm also really honored to uh, be able to invite up to the stage uh, colleagues Greg Nevins and Eric Cole. Uh, and they're going to do uh, a little more introductions in just a second. But we thought it was really important uh, to, to, to look back at just this 20 year anniversary of Lawrence v. Texas. Um, and they're going to get into some more details of the meaning of, of <coughs> this particular case, uh, what built up to the case, and what it means today. Because as Kevin was alluding to, uh, what we thought we had taken care of, we need to start talking about it again. Right? So, um, I'm going to pass the mics over to these fabulous and wonderful colleagues and friends, um, and so take it away. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's great to be here, so you can hear my voice again. Uh, I'm going to take somebody in for a minute. If Kevin just said I should be ready or something. Uh, um, so I'm really excited to basically hear these two people talk as, as experts to get a free model about the purpose I got with Boston. And I decided it was too difficult for me, so I became a philosopher. <laughs> um, but we, we want to really talk about uh, a little bit of context. I think Kevin sort of, uh, you know, very brilliantly sort of opened by pointing out some of the history around the sodomy laws, right, and in this country. But we're going to zoom into some of the more recent history. I think it is important, as Michael also iterated, that these laws, similar to Roe versus Wade, right, are not things that are sort of forever. Um, and transit in our history that we frequently and commonly have to stay really aggressive the fact that there are powers that can reverse some of the gains that we've made if we allow that to happen. Uh, it's important to note that um, it was a Georgia case, uh, Bowers versus Harvard, in 1986 that upheld sodomy laws in the United States. So the thing that upheld sodomy laws was actually something that was done right here in the state of Georgia. Uh, Lambda Legal then won the case of the Supreme Court in 2003, right? Just 20 years ago, right? Um, making sodomy laws unconstitutional. Um, but it's really, I mean, if you think about how many people here are, were alive when that case happened, I mean, most of us in the room, right? I think that's not so much. It was probably, it's probably the only person here that wasn't. Uh, but sometimes I think it, uh, we talk about this at the center when people go through the museum with a lot of people today uh, that black and white they just kind of play a trick on our minds at times. So we see these images and say, oh, that was so long ago. And I remember even taking some young people through the civil rights uh, exhibit. And they're like, oh, wow, this happened a long time ago. And I asked them how old their grandparents were or what year their grandparents were. And they were like, oh, yeah, my grandma was very much alive when all this stuff was happening. So it really brought the past a little approximate. I think it's important for us to do the same when we think about the fact that the word age was not said uh, at the height of the pandemic uh, that took so many lives. Uh, so today we're going to unpack with these two gentlemen 
Uh, some of the recent history to set up our discussion, sort of what's coming up next in the Georgia legislative session, uh, and the work that I'm doing at the center, uh, I'm really happy because in, in conjunction with uh, Georgia Folly, uh, hey, hey Jeff, you know we're, we're doing a youth belong at the state house in March, uh, that Alex is helping set up. And so we have a group of young people that once a month uh, we do different events, youth belonging films next week, where they'll be showing films and talking about advocacy. And we're going to take about 50 youth to the state house so they can learn about the ecosystem of how legislation is passed. It's one of the ways that we ensure that that history, right, uh, is mapped to be the future for what we want to be. So I'm going to start with you there. Um, I want you to introduce yourself. Uh, if you don't want to do that. It, it, it's long uh, but introduce yourself and maybe as a part of that context, uh, talk a little bit about uh, being a uh, Tyrone Burnham Memorial Legal Fellow at Legal, which you're a part of that sort of illustrious family of Legal people who passed each other through So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I think it's still good morning. morning. Uh, good so good morning, everyone, again. I'm Eric Falk, I use he, him, pronouns. Um, just a little bit about me, as a civil mentor, uh, I'm a former uh, Garner Fellow, uh, former Deputy Director at Georgia Quality, um, and then I was on the board of New York Listen. Uh, so I feel like this is a, a family sort of full circle uh, moment uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and so, um, the Carter Fellowship <laughs> for Grand Legal uh, was really important for me. I just want to sort of bring like Tyrone Garner into the into the room just for for a second. Um, you know, Tyrone Garner, uh, you may not know, uh, was uh, a black gay man, uh, the youngest of ten children, uh, born to a Southern Baptist family, Houston, Texas. Um, after he graduated from high school. He went to school to be, uh, essentially, um, to do secretary work. Um, that didn't really pan out a lot. Um, he had a lot of different odd jobs. He was a cook. He was a house uh, uh, keeper. Um, he did a lot of these sort of like odd jobs. Um, he never owned a bar. He never owned a home. He never rented a place <coughs> at his home. Um, he lived with relatives and, and friends uh, for most of his life. Um, and he is one of the plaintiffs in Barnes in Texas. Um, you know, I think sometimes the sort of like human piece gets this. Um, so I want to hold space for, for Tyrone today. Uh, he was 31, um, you know, when the whole case came about in 1998. So he was a young man um, who uh, really had a lot to sacrifice, right? Uh, sort of when you think about John Lawrence, who was, you know, more sort of like middle class, you know, who was a white man who, you know, kind of had his stuff together, right? Um, and so you have Tyrone Garner, who has a lot to lose. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of like the details of the piece. Um, and so I think that's like an important like touch point. Um, I think also just sort of like thinking about some of the things that have come up um, just in the conversation today. I remember being in a room with you, Michael Shutt, and, and with Jeff, and interviewing at, at Georgia Quality. And one of the things that I said in that interview was that I wanted to work for Georgia Quality because there would be some young black kid in rural South Georgia like me who would see me and say, oh, I can like actually fight to be my whole self and to be able to bring my whole self into to spaces. Um, and so this fellowship sort of like means that to me, Tyrone sort of like means that to me. You know, that this person who, to a lot of folks, did not have a whole lot, was able to like give of themselves, you know, in this way, um, that allows this really great benefit to all of us. Um, and so really happy that Family Legal has had this fellowship, you know, in place to bring more African American lawyers into the space. Uh, we know that diversity is, a, is, a, is an issue um, as it relates 
to folks who are doing work in the space, especially in the legal spaces. And so definitely from them, I am legal for the efforts um, around creating this uh, fellowship and really uh, another way for us to honor the um, legacy uh, in order to be a And so I think that's sort of like theme today, sort of like ordinary heroes uh, definitely resonates in, resonates in this story. I want you to say a little bit about the relevance and importance of his case and his identity in the context of when the legal broader work, right, and the work that it's consistent. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it fits in, you know, so nicely, again, we're in a space where we're revisiting, you know, a lot of the things that have happened in the past. And it's really great to have sort of that context of about, you know, where we come from, but also, like, what are the lessons that are Alarm, right? Um, you know, when police were called, uh, you know, around this uh, case, it was, you know, someone called the police and said that there was a, a, a black man holding a gun. And so there are all these sort of like racial implications there as well um, that I think, you know, in the society that we're living in today, the situation could have gone very differently, right? Um, Maybe there would have not been a large in Texas case and you know, the situation had gone differently. And so I think it's really important to really think about the work in a very intersectional way. Um, and I think the Legend of was is striving to be more intersectional uh, about um, how they're approaching the legal work. It's really interesting because I don't think I knew that specific fact about moving gun and the sort of criminalization of black bodies sort of trouble over, right? Like this, this idea of somebody wielding a gun. There's something else happening, but that's the more violent story that resonates with people that led to uh, this criminal <coughs> in the first place. Uh, finally, I, I want you to say a little bit about being a fellow at Medical Legal, uh, sort of connected to this and the work that that fellowship is doing to sort of train and cultivate leaders to take ordinary stories, ordinary people, and, and leverage those experiences to create uh, more freedom. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when I think about myself, when I think about some of the other fellows that um, I'm in contact with, um, you know, I think it definitely, like, uh, propelled a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, you know, I think my work, which I, you know, centers, like, blackness, um, centers having a critical uh, race lens, uh, that is very community-centered. Uh, you know, I think warriors sometimes um, are viewed as sort of, like, they know they, 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 they know everything about everything, and we sometimes see it into that. Um, but really the role of the warrior is, you know, just an odd you know, right? We offer a, a specific set of skills that's no different than, you know, the person who is a community organizer, uh, who, you know, has a very specific set of skills. And so how do we think about our work in a very collective way? Um, how does this work? You know, the work of land of legal, then types of work that's happening, you know, at Georgia Clock. And all these pieces just really sort of like tied together. Um, so uh, it really was a good sort of like setup for me to do the, the things that follow um, to, you know, really uh, learn a lot about, about policy things, be really engaged there, but also understand the, the legal, you know, triggers and how that might uh, play the part. I want to move on to you, Greg. Uh, I'll ask you to introduce yourself first, but then and, and I'm going to have you do that first, and I'll go to some other person. Um, I'm Greg Evans, he, him, pronouns. Um, I've been a, a lawyer at Van Little. It'll be uh, 22 years tomorrow. So. Um, <laughs> and. Um, and yeah, the, um, uh, so yeah, when I when, when I got to uh, um, well, uh, oh, I don't want to miss work too much, but, but yeah, so I, mean, I, I got so I started in January of 2002. So Lawrence had not yet happened, I but I mean actually the incident in Houston happened and started all, but but the, the Supreme Court case and I happened. Which which is going to segue to the next question, which is right. Came into land with legal and then shortly after, you know, welcome. <laughs> now, now you have this big piece to deal with. So tell us a little bit about uh, the Supreme Court ruling in Lawrence versus Texas in some context 
for what happened in 86 uh, in the court decision in Ballard versus Hardwick. Uh, what was this case that came out of the Well, uh, so in, in, in 1982, uh, Michael Hardwick was uh, arrested for for violating the Georgia sodomy law, and um, I believe I think it was in Fulton County, but it, the the um, and he was he was you know booked and taken downtown, but, but then the the, the uh, uh, district attorney said. You know, unless there's somebody else more to this one, I'm not going to prosecute this. Um, and um, um, the um, and, but but Michael Hart, Michael Harper decided to file a lawsuit against uh, the Attorney General Mike Powers and various other people, um, basically to get, to get the uh, statute declared unconstitutional. So that, that's why it, it has, has a the odd name of Powers and Harper. Most of the saw me. Uh, it was, it, cases have our commonwealth versus so and so state versus so and so because they, they're criminal cases and that's the loop, but that, that's it's still always in that. But he, he, this was a uh, he, he was actually arrested, but then that got dismissed. He, 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 he tried to get it invalidated, uh, or he go on validated, and it, he, he was thrown out at the trial court. At the 11th Circuit here in uh, in Atlanta actually ruled in his favor. Um, it was, uh, um, and, and, and there was one, one thing that was interesting about that. There, it was, the decision was two to one, but all three judges were thought wanted to look at the side of the law. But one of them thought, uh, one of them believed that the, the, a 1975 uh, summary affirmance by the Supreme Court in, in, uh, in the case called Doe versus Common Supreme meant that it, it, it was binding on them. And the reason why I bring that up is because it, 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 it I don't know, folks, probably not many people, but when they're doing the marriage quality work, there was a case called Baker versus Nelson, and, and so these are two examples of the Supreme Court not saying a word, not explaining the only thing they're doing, but just turning down a case in a certain way that, that created a, a barrier to the precedent. And it just it, it kind of goes back to it, it reinforces what that 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 uh, the, 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 the expression where the state might not be about first they laugh at you when they bring a good gift, and then second then then they make serious, and then eventually you win. I, I, I'm just giving a little steps, but um, but but really, I mean, it, it was it was so uh, you know it was it was treated such so, uh, so, so dismissively in the early seventies our, our rights that 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 it was pretty more then actually they they sometimes they turned things down in a way that actually created binding precedent and that was a problem for us both with the sovereign laws and with their quality. Um, so in in, in the nineteen but so back Michael. Uh, so Michael Hart was going for the 11th Circuit, but it went to the Supreme Court where it was 5 to 4. Um, and my uh, my common law professor argued it. He, he said, you know, if we if we'd won, that would have been a page 10. It would have been a nothing burger. I mean, like, like people just would have expected that, 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 of course, of course, we can't go, you know, the government can't be enforcing uh, sex law. There's private sexual conduct law between consenting adults. Um, and um, but but it, so it was very surprising when 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 they um, when they ruled that they upheld the law, and the you know the fact that so in the inter, so the, the period between eighty six and two thousand three, the main effect of those laws, you know, is it, I mean what, what happened to what happened to uh, Tom Burner and John Marks is, is is rather rare, and what happened to Michael Harper is rather rare. Is, I mean that that situation doesn't usually present itself. What does present itself, what did present itself often is the, uh, uh, you know, a woman uh, going through a divorce and, and, and of course, saying something like, well, conduct in inherent lesbianism is a, is a classic felony in this thing. So, in other words, you see, you're not a good, you're not a good mother, you shouldn't have custody. That happened in Virginia. And, 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 and over and over, it's used, it was used in different contexts to, because you're, you're, you're a criminal. Thing. So, I mean, it, 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 therefore, you know, uh, it's, it's not discrimination uh, to to uh, favor a criminal, not not criminal for a job or a criminal, right? So uh, and so over and over, and, and so that in the military, you don't have to tell it, 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 it was over and over. It was used outside, totally outside the criminal context as a bludgeon. Um, and, and the guy who took the guy working uh, um, uh, uh, for these was in Texas, of course. Uh, he you know he said you know if, if there's not that. Not much to do 
uh, when people think they're either crazy or criminals, you know, and we got rid of the, the uh, I shouldn't use that term, I know, but, but, but the, um, uh, but the American Psychological, the Psychological Association undid their demand, they've been doing here since 1973, and that has been interesting, because they're not thinking about changing their mind. Um, but the, uh, and, 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 and but, but we still need to get over the criminals and really have them to be able to build Absolutely. It's interesting that you mentioned the ACA. Uh, one of the things I think about is sort of this emergence of language. Uh, Kevin talked about purpose. Right? And when I think about it now, like literally I, on social media, I've been called a groomer because I'm teaching young people about LGBTQ advocacy. Right? I don't think that was really happening even 10 years ago for me. So there's been this kind of permissive reemergence of this language around LGBTQ people being psychologically unfit or um, you know having issues despite the APA's you know uh, uh, you know uh, denouncement of that that logic is kind of re-emerging because I think that one of the things that I think is important to right, the, the National Center for Civil Human Rights, uh, one of my tasks as the, uh, the leader of the institute is to kind of make that conversation I thought about the name of the organization right the Society for Human Rights was how they guise the LGBTQ organization. And I think it's important that we return to really uh, establishing and doubling down the right the idea that LGBTQ rights are human right? Uh, because what they are attempting to do now, right, is to dehumanize LGBTQ people by saying that we're psychologically unwell, especially if it's around trans and non binary identities, that there's some kind of mental illness uh, that's going on or the criminalization of people by saying uh, you're a groomer or that again I, I thought it was really brilliant what Kevin said about how people <coughs> when they want to sort of demonize people they say they're only for the kids. Um, and it's something I kind of anecdotally have known and seen but to see that that happens to different people um, is, is potentially a way I think that we uh, bring marginalized communities together by understanding there's kind of a common enemy and they're using the same playbook <laughs> across different communities. Um, Greg, I do want to ask you, uh, you, you came to the uh, regional office um, one when Lambda League, at the time Lambda League, was one of the cases striking down the sodomy law. Uh, how did this help with that Supreme Court uh, victory uh, later in 2002? Oh, three. Yeah. So the uh, so the uh, the legal uh, landscape during the in the uh, period between Bowers and Lawrence. Um, so it, it, so, so if, uh, there's you you, can, you have rights under your under the United States Constitution. You also have rights under your state constitution. Sometimes they're not any more than what you have in the United States Constitution. Sometimes they are. Depends what the yeah, look, what's what's in the state constitution and how the state Supreme Court is interpreting. So after. And the U.S. Supreme Court said the U.S. the federal Constitution doesn't doesn't guarantee you it doesn't allow you uh, the liberty to engage in uh, in, 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 in sovereignty and privacy of your own home. Um, five states adopted um, their sovereignty laws, and they were the arch liberal jurisdictions of Kentucky, Tennessee, Montana, Georgia, and Arkansas. And uh, so. That, there, there's just something about that that you know, like, that, you know, like I think it's kind of some powerful message to the Supreme Court that like you know they, maybe that's happened, maybe that is wrong. I didn't know that. So yeah, but, uh, but I mean, it, it is just it is just um, so I mean it, it's like oh we're we're uh, we're, we're behind those the, 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 you know the, 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 and, and so um, and I think it had a tremendous I think it had a tremendous impact. Uh, it, various organizations that, um, um, you know, one of those five uh, victories, at, uh, and the last one was Arkansas in 2002, right before, and, and uh, one of my colleagues argued that, won that, and, and it, 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 I go like, oh, it's over now, I'm going to, you know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, I mean, we, 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 you know, certainly have to feel in the very order that they make the case, and, the, the, uh, and first off, we just ruled, if you just upheld the laws 17 years ago, you don't need to take this case to do that again if you're, if you're uh, just going to the case. And things. So, yeah. It's really interesting. It reminds me of, of the recent the November elections and the sort of public mandate around uh, body autonomy and abortion. 
right? Uh, and when I saw Kentucky, Ohio, Kansas, you know, overwhelmingly say that like we want to maintain this right for people, you know, the faith of the right was like, oh, that doesn't work. Let's come out and turn to people. I think that's that's really what's happened, right? Like we can't win on uh, on abortion rights anymore because these states that are traditionally uh, conservative have even overwhelmingly said we don't want this. And so how can we mobilize people? Uh, and leverage uh, what they're afraid about, right? People moving kids, uh, people mutilating uh, kids and, and children's hospitals, all of this rhetoric and language. And because uh, the assumption is most people don't think they're those trans and non binary people, that that's going to be able to be leveraged to kind of gain some attention. Um, Eric, I want to actually talk with you about sort of the complexities of these different pieces, right? The 86 case of power versus Harway, uh, the 88, the 1998 power versus the state of Florida, and then Lawrence versus Texas. Why is it important uh, for us to understand the complexities of those changing laws throughout the courts, even in today's economy? Yeah, I think that the first thing that comes to mind is that it takes a long time. Uh, you know, it's a process. I mean, I think the same is true with like policy change work. It is, it is very much a process. And so all the interventions that happen in between the sort of like community-based interventions, you know, where, you know, we are, you know, pumping around sort of desynchronizing language, right? Uh, where we are helping folks uh, to understand, you know, what gender means or doesn't mean, right? Uh, I think all those interventions are really important. You know, we talk a lot about, like, yes, we can change laws. Uh, yes, we can, you know, uh, get things through the courts. But we also have to change hearts and minds. And so that hearts and minds work is also, like, critically, like, important to all of the legal work and to all of the um, policy work that happens as well. Because that's going to be sort of, like, a critical piece. Like, you can pass laws and people can still, you know, be like, I'm not going to, you know, respect your, your, your liberty, right? Um, and so there's also this piece just around sort of like, we know that it's probably going to take a long, a longer time to like get some of the change, um, but there's still work that has to happen um, where there could be these sort of like uh, usher in the change once it does happen. It also makes me think of, you know, I had the case in 2003, I remember 2015, right, was when marriage equality became federal, and it's almost this sort of, and every time we have a game, there's like a, a tweak in the playbook to figure out like, well, what can we do next, right? And I think some of us anticipated. I know I was working uh, at Teach for America at the time. I think you were listening. That's how I connected to Kevin initially, and uh, I, I was happy that that equality passed because I knew it would expose a whole host of other vulnerabilities. And that marriage equality wasn't this golden ticket. They're like, oh, we can get married now, everything's fixed, right? Like, yeah, marriage equality passed. I think even that was reaffirmed uh, recently in terms of uh, sort of a doubling down, even by some people on the right, around the preservation of marriage equality. But now it's like, we have to find the next thing. So I think it's really important for us and for legal practitioners to stay really vigilant and be ahead of uh, what's coming down the pipe. And, you know, I know this is an election year, 2024 is all going to be about us. Let's, who are the people who can pick one that people will not have to do? Um, so it's really important. Um, want to uh, ask you, Greg, so after lunch, we were feeling pretty good about the law. Then we had the 2022 job decision come down from the Supreme Court overturning growth. Uh, and it also elevated discussions of whether Lawrence and other cases should be be litigated. We've actually heard, uh, especially with the Constitution <coughs> of the Supreme Court right now, that there are some people that want to revisit some of those games that were made around the American quality uh, and other things. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about, about where we are right now? Uh, well, yeah, and, and oh. so, and, 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 and the one person who actually came out said he wanted to go revisit it, it, yeah, it, it Wait, uh, yeah, I think he just got an off the yacht with the Harlan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but uh, yeah, 
and um, so this is a uh, you know so Roe Ro versus Wade was based on uh, essentially the, the, the liberty uh, uh, part of the uh, of the Fourteenth Amendment, and the um, the, you know, and so it was, uh, and so it, and so, and so was Lawrence. Lawrence and, and basically, what the Supreme Court said is that uh, we need to, in order to construe that, uh, construe what that, that means, we have to go back to, um, you know, when these things came into being, and, 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 and ask what, what did the people back then think. And of course, and, and they usually do it by with reference to not not like speeches or 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 you know, uh, but, but uh, or you know. You know, so, and the by what laws were passed, and of course, therefore, we we know who was making those laws, who was making those laws, and who who wasn't making those laws. Um, and so it's, I mean, and, and, and I mean, it was I, I mean, it's, it's, the reason why so many people were um, were frightened by that by that ruling, and also the, the you know gun control ruling, which is you know this whole thing that you know for basically they they, they have to get the uh, Marty and Flynn and Deloria ready at all times so they go back and find out what, what the answer to all these questions are. And, and, and you know, it, it, it's, so it, it, it's, um, and, and also it, it doesn't help when you're, when you try to, uh, you know, so Clarence Thomas said in this separate opinion, and Alito tried to, uh, um, what he, he tried to uh, buy a piece for the day, I mean, I think, I think he's probably, probably uh, good at, is one of you who at, uh, who would do this? He's trying to say, "Oh, God, this decision doesn't mean that because um, because uh, this involves take abortion involves taking of a life or it, uh, or it, uh, it of life, and none of these other things do." But when when, when, when the factor that you to say with something is not part of the test in the first place, I mean, your only test is like what did what did, you know what was part of liberty in you know 1789 or 1868. Then, then you, you know it's very suspicious when that when somebody comes to a distinguishing factor that you don't have the decision anywhere else in the opinion. So, um, so that's that's why a lot of people really are, are really concerned about. It. I mean, the one that, that, that's particularly dangerous, and, and you heard, um, I don't know who the names of the Johnson Mitchell. I think Kevin Johnson Mitchell was out behind the uh, uh, um, SBA in uh, tech in Texas. Um, what was the uh, you know it, it, it has Lawrence in his sights, but I mean, it's like it isn't on it, it isn't really on when most people radar spread. I mean, like, this isn't anything even even that most of the religious right that, uh, um, are, are focused on, um, um, especially as they need to you know they're, they're sort of losing off the abortion. That, uh, I mean, the, the actual abortion um, you know laws that they thought they were going to be able to <coughs> of Roe versus Wade was overturned. So, um, so, but still, it, it, is, it is very concerning that that the you know the people, some people in the Supreme Court would would, um, would go back and revisit that, and um, you know, so it, it's definitely something uh, that we need to be fit for and history, and we'll show it someday. But I, I don't think it's not that good. None of uh, of anyone said that. I want to start to talk a little bit and move into. Uh, uh, some other areas and what they mean for Georgia, and certainly what we need to for the QA from our audience. But, uh, you know, what are your hopes and concerns for what this progress may mean in the context of things like uh, trans laws and HIV criminalization uh, in the state of Georgia? So, Eric, uh, you first. Yeah, I mean, so I think it's what you lifted up is, you know, all these kind of balls are just sort of like body autonomy, right? Um, and so, you know, the policing of bodies, I think, will, you know, continue as has always been sort of like a thing. Um, and so, you know, we saw, you know, this past Thursday session uh, with the increase here in Georgia with a number of, you know, trans, uh, anti trans legislation. Uh, we have made some progress in Georgia. Uh, we're performing the HIV criminal, criminal law here. Uh, so that has been, you know, at least like a glimmer of, of, of something. Uh, Can you give people a little bit of context to sort of like the criminalization previously? Yeah. And so, um, and I guess that has been a year. It was a year in June uh, that the HIV criminalization law 
was performed here uh, in Georgia. Um, and what it did was it, you know, reduced the following down. It was previously 10 years to five years. Um, that now has to be uh, an element of intent. Uh, so that part is like really important to uh, make sure that, you know, uh, folks are uh, being protected. Um, it took out the provision around um, uh, spit and urine, uh, specifically around correctional uh, officers and other peace officers. And so uh, it was kind of a citizen uh, enhancement if you like prove spit, urine, or feces on a peace officer or a correctional officer. Right. Uh, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it also decriminalized uh, oranges with another piece of that. And so <coughs> the law has it, been completely uh, a very good for so much now. Decriminalized uh, under the law. Uh, it put some really great guardrails in place, and it was a really great win. Uh, that was all shout out, you know, uh, George Pauly, uh, who, you know, led uh, the coalition in, in, in the work um, over, you know, about 17 years and again, we talk about a long process that takes a lot of like making changes. Um, but the advocacy works, you um, gotta keep going. Um, but that I think is a good example of, of just a minute. Um, but you know, Kevin looked it up as well that you know, there are gonna be more and more of these anti trans laws, and so that is just something that we definitely want to keep an eye on. Curious with, with regard to the data decriminalization, can you speak a little bit to? We can talk about intersectionality, but intersectionality, first and foremost, is a legal concept, right? Uh, you know, I can't really cringe on the legal scholars that we have trying to talk about this disproportionate impact of HIV criminalization uh, on Black queer men. Can you speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. So um, we partnered with the Williams Institute at uh, UCLA just to do some research on who's actually criminalized. And so it was almost 70% of the folks who um, are charged under the law in Georgia uh, were African American. Uh, the majority of those folks were black men. Um, and so when you start to look at, you know, um, across the country, you know, when you look at, you know, Tennessee, uh, when you look at uh, Louisiana, overwhelmingly, uh, you know, the folks who are criminalized under these laws uh, are easily. Uh, black, we don't know necessarily if they are the same gender loving or not, uh, but we know this black man from a large number of the law. Uh, can you speak, Greg, to some of the, uh, you know, what we had uh, 500 anti LGBTQ law in 2023? I think Kevin or someone reported that already in 2024, it's only been what? What's the day? I think there are over a hundred anti LGBTQ laws that have been proposed introduced, introduced just this year, which is bizarre when you think about it, like it's been a week, right? Uh, and that's what tripled the number at the rate last year, which is also a record year of anti LGBTQ legislation. So uh, they are coming for us. And yeah, can you say something about? that in the context of what land we were doing in preparation for those legislative sessions. Um yeah, um yeah, yeah. so you will a lot of things there it, 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 you can and, and well one thing we need to do is to make sure that the that we don't have that the terrain doesn't uh, uh, expand where these laws are actually passed. Right now it's um um, it's it's basically the same same old thing that the, it, 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 the states have acted. So when it comes to states have passed these laws, it's the same, it's the exact ones that you would think it is, and the ones that haven't passed them are the exact ones you think <coughs> for the most part. I mean, so it is. Um, uh, I mean, like, like, what is it, 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 the, the um, correlation between which states have passed non-discrimination laws um, uh, and, and, and those and the states that, that didn't pass that is almost not. There are like two exceptions on each side um, um, that, that, that basically say it, 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 it is half and half, roughly half and half. Um, so, so one of the things is, is we, you know, we, want, we want to make sure that, um, 
that, that, that these, that these that some of the things go like, wow, these might be a good idea. Let's start, we should start casting these ourselves. Uh, I mean, we, that is what we want to see. That, that, that doesn't happen. And obviously, I mean, our, our what we do is, is uh, I mean, we, we, sometimes we work with um, the advocacy groups, and especially if they're trying to, they have a concerted effort to, um, to try to block the bill, they want to help them, you know, if, if, if there's a, a, a Provide it. And, um, now we always we always check the the holy groups first because uh, the last thing you want to do is is give a give a bill more life and give a bill and, and, uh, and the legitimacy or and uh, heighten its uh, profile any more than is necessary to make it be nice. So if somebody may be uh, already spoke to the, a lot of the holy words that you have well connected either committee chairs and speakers that that. that uh, that, that help out a lot in yeah, that kind of that kind of area. So, um, but we, you know, so and then we always then we see a big challenge so that they do improve. And, uh, to, and, uh, I mean, obviously, um, that I'm all of them can be challenged, and a lot of times you don't need to like if certain so, so they're in the same circuit than, than whatever. Really, you know, you you, you can just pick one uh, and and do that and take care of the others. But uh, but but basically, uh, there's, uh, you know, help. help. I'll try to make sure the thing doesn't jump on and, and then attack it. Because, uh, Aaron, can you speak to <coughs> this ecosystem, the work of a land of equal in conjunction of partnership with the work of, say, George Equality, right? Because it's often these cases, these individual cases by ordinary people that is that are pivotal in sort of shaping the direction of legislation one way or the other. Now, can you speak about the relationship between you know, them? Organization you Yeah, I mean, I think the work is really a lot of stuff, um, you know, especially during legislative session. You know, being in constant communication with our legal partners, be, be it Lambda Legal or other organizations, um, is, is really critical, you know, to the work to get, you know, perspective, um, to, you know, think about the language of, you know, uh, your goals. You know what's the real impact they saw of how the deal can be crafted. Um, so you know that relationship is is really a very close relationship. Um, it should work in concert. Again, I think to Greg's point, you know you don't want to give more light to uh, you know a piece of legislation. You know that you know uh, the quality of organizations feels differently about. You know. And so I think that communication loop. Has the ability to type. Um, I think one of the strengths, you know, especially here in Georgia, is that like, really strong um, communication. Can you give an example of a case where that may have happened in terms of giving life to something um, that may complicate um, that work? Well, I mean, I think even with, you know, maybe some of the, because, I mean, you know, there's also sort of like the political reality. Of state that you're working with. And so, you know, if folks who are on the ground, folks who are at the state house every day, you know, have information, uh, are working in some partnership with allies who are a legislature, you know, all of those things really like are kind of the nuance um, that I think, you know, uh, that these organizations have to be in conversation about. And so, you know, I can't think of a piece of legislation in, in particular right this moment. Um, but, you know, there's a piece of, of trans legislation, you know, folks who uh, are in Georgia Poly who are working with their lobbyists and who are working with, you know, folks, uh, you, know, uh, you know, maybe like, well, we don't really feel like this is going anywhere. So, you know, our position may be, you know, um, not as strong on a piece of legislation because, you know, the inner workings kind of tell us that, like, this probably is not going to be a lot of And in particular, when you think about the Constitution of the Georgia State Legislature and who you have to convince to get some of the facts, it's a really complicated story. Uh, before we go to audience q and I did want to ask both of you around. And I think, you know, part of my role at, at the Institute is to um, kind of inform and educate people more broadly about this ecosystem. Uh, but it's, it goes back to what you said, sort of, sort of like ordinary people feeling like they have a stake in what's happening. I think sometimes 
uh, legal language, legislative language, and just be like, oh, this is just too much, right? Uh, how do we, what, what are both of your opinions on the things that we can do on the ground as grassroots community organizers to give people a sense that these organizations do really work and they do a lot of work on, on behalf of people uh, advancing LGBTQ rights? Yeah, I think the first thing is probably like even survive. You know, I think, you know, some people are like, oh, policy, equal work, I don't understand that. And so how do you, you just apply that? How do you help people like understand, you know, how they see themselves in the work? Um, you know, I think it goes back to, you know, when we started the conversation around Tyrone Carter, right? You know, this was an individual that, you know, folks probably have written off to some degree, right? Um, but I think that all of us, can see ourselves in the work that's happening. You know, how do we build uh, bigger tents that are more intersectional? The, they're doing the same thing to all of us. You know, whether it's LGBTQ rights, whether it's, you know, reproductive justice work, you know, whether it's racial justice issues, it's, it's all the same framework, right? And I think the, the more that we're able to talk about how systems are created, you know, to oppress, you know, certain groups, um, and how we're able to, like, see ourselves in each other's struggles, um, I think that will help. Um, and us really being able to say, well, okay, this may not be the end all be all. It's not going to be the, the silver bullet that solves the problems. But this is a tool in our tool belt, and we want to be able to actualize that. Um, I think what you're doing around sort of bringing young people to the capital to like learn about the process, I think is really important. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, School systems have always done this job of, you know, um, talking about, you know, civics and what civic participation means, what that looks like. You know, what does a mayor do versus city council? What's, you know, the power of, you know, um, the mayor, you know, versus someone on city council? And I think a lot of people don't know that. Uh, and it's okay that people don't know that. But for, uh, for those of us who do, I think that we should share that knowledge with people uh, and, and not in the way that I roll with people because I think that's another part of it is that you know this needs to be uh, really like genuine and community led it's not about like oh I know so much more than you no this is a tool that I want you to be able to access this is why it's important this is how it's worked um, and this is potentially how it works I love that piece about relevance. I think about as from an educator background, uh, you know, Atlanta was just sort of posted as getting like the highest index score of our Because I'm, I'm really aware that, you know, Atlanta can often, you know, the city to too busy to hate and all that. Uh, uh, it's but kind of it, it does. <laughs> But it's also interesting, but also where that like don't need to be students don't have protection in, in school in Atlanta. That teachers that I have mentored and worked with regularly have to let them to be let go of or fired if they came out to students. And this is in the city too busy to hate, and the city that's like so hate friendly and everything else. So I think we also have to be brave and bold enough to call out those contradictions. Because I think that's a lot of you really want to hold it to that standard, but it's not about billboards or the fact that they're going to have a rainbow at the airport. Uh, that, you know, well, I think mean, it's true. Like, it's, it's, I mean, there, there's this sort of cosmetic sort of delivery of what that kind of stands for. And I actually want that to be true at all levels of what people are experiencing on day to day. I'm curious if you have any comments connected to that. Very well, you, 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 on your question of, 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 of you know, demystifying and, and making it relevant and digestible people. Normally, that takes care of itself with our work and our litigation work because we're, you know, I mean, because the law is now affecting somebody. And, and so, you know, we're no longer talking about a, a, a ban on interscholastic competition for attractive, but we're talking about uh, our, our client, you know, uh, uh, you know, an 11 year old from West Virginia who now, now makes a lot of cross country cases. We, we, we won for the Supreme Court on that. And so it, it makes it tangible. 
And and the reason why and the reason why you know that it, that 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 matters is because the way common sense is that the other side that, um, has now taken to like, like hmm, you know what would be better if, 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 if in in um, reducing in attacking the rights of the other side if they aren't a part if they aren't a party to the case at all. I mean, so if, if we just go in there, I mean, and this is what happened most recently. In this case called 303 creative that's a Supreme Court that said which is this web designer who said uh, who said I am I'm worried about this uh, this law <coughs> and I'm, 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 I want, I'm starting a, uh, a, a marriage uh, marriage, uh, marriage web page uh, uh, business and I, I don't and my religious beliefs are not with you religious beliefs like, I don't want to I don't want, I don't want to uh, do the first age test levels and um, and I it, it, like, basically uh, filed a lawsuit just Declared that he didn't have, uh, didn't have to, and and the great thing about that was there was no there, there were no victims there, were, there was no issue. You saw her website. It was trash. I don't. Did you say that? But I'm like, what game of one heard of this? Well, I'm going to talk about that later. Um, but Never in front of anyone, and as Timmy said, uh, she probably never was going to be. But but, it, um, but yeah, and, and, and there used to be rules about what kind of cases you could bring, and there had to be like some actual actual threat or something like that. And that's kind of been eroded by some efforts on on the other side. And, and certainly this was a very example of that. But, but normally, you know, we, we uh, I mean, the, it, it's unfortunate that, that there are victims of these laws, but but. It, it, at least that they they get their name in court, it puts you human face on it and, and helps you know educate the public about what's really at stake. And and the other side sees it and goes like, well, let's, let's see if we can prevent that from happening. So we just make it, you know, <coughs> in this hypothetical uh, uh, impersonal mode. Which we're seeing a lot of these anti trans happening too, right? Like how many states are passing legislation and they they don't even have any trans athletes. And I guess it's just like, okay, we're spending this money to present some, because it might happen at some point, right? So a lot of fear mongering, a lot of projection of the worst case scenarios, and then people are sort of being enticed to not in that arena. But I really want to open it up to uh, to you to, to ask both uh, Eric and Greg questions or to bring forth the terms that you have at CFA. Yes, I believe that um, Amicus briefs have been filed to ask the Supreme Court to take up um, one of these uh, cases where gender affirming care for minors has been prohibited. And I guess um, I'm wondering, and I know it's dangerous to speculate, but if you could cautiously speculate what that might look like, especially before this Supreme Court, I don't know if you have thoughts. Well, they wouldn't be as educated as my colleagues over there. Um, uh, there yeah, so someone else would uh, uh, would be able to address this better. But so the um, so in the it was it was um, the decision to take that up was, was based in a large part about just about how how draconian the, the, the ban was, and also honestly an assessment of which of, which of the which of the various things that. Uh, uh, types of uh, legislation would be the, would, would 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 seem to be like the most um, you know uh, the court would go like oh no that that's obviously not <laughs> and then I mean you start talking about like you know a bunch of legislators deciding um, what what medical you know you know what medical care is 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 should be given to um, and so I mean and, and then it went from only youth to uh, not only youth. In like, uh, like almost overnight, and so, um, in, in some places, and, 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 and even if, even if it's uh, geared only towards youth, um, you know, you, you, there's a question of like, well, wait a second, um, because a lot of the other measures that they're doing are are are, 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 are on the basis that parents should have control over, or the parent, like parents, like they have forced outing. That force or encourage outing bills in schools. So, in other words, if a, parent, if a teacher finds out that you know uh, uh, that one of the students is LGBT, they're either encouraged or required to out that to the parents. And there's also uh, 
you know, their equipment basically. So, so they're in it, and they're saying, well, it's open because parents have a right, you know, have a right to know this. But when it comes to parents who want to support their uh, uh, kids and, and, and work with medical professionals to determine that, that this is a good course of uh, treatment or a good course of care for the um, for the you know for the student, then uh, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're not going to allow that to happen. So I mean, it's it's, it's sort of like, oh, we, we we want to empower parents parents to parents to uh, if they're going to do this is what we want them to do. So. And so it, it, so the thought was that there was sort of vulnerability because of the uh, hypocrisy and, and uh, among the very kind of bills that are that, that have been taken up there. Also, I, I think it's important like language and messaging is really important. Uh, in Ohio, the uh, the bill was uh, Governor Biden actually vetoed, but which is expected that the legislator will overturn. This, this bill, uh, which is House Bill 68, the common name of this was Save Adolescents from Experimentation Act. Right? If, if you don't know anything about the community and you're seeing a bill that's called Save Adolescents from Experimentation, it, it might be a little enticing or seductive as a parent, right? As the whole thing is kind of <coughs> save the children. So I think. Um, but the institute in my role in conjunction with them, the legal and three quality and other partners have to do a better job of messaging, right? Because they're winning that fight in terms of how they frame things to entice and get people to sort of be sympathetic to things that are really uh, problematic. Uh, but I think we have to do a lot better work around how do we message the fact uh, that this is actually happening and what gender appropriate care actually is it does. As you mentioned, uh, I think it was Oklahoma was one of the first states to put a proof to that like this is not about kids. Because they kept raising the age. <laughs> right. Like at first it was like, oh kids and like, oh well, 18 before you make a decision about your body, uh, about being trans. But it was like, oh like that's gonna raise it to 24 to age people we got this is about the, the extermination of trans people all together. This is not about saving kids. I think you have to do a good job or a better job of making sure that that's um, Other questions I have a few hands yeah. in the back. Yes. Um, so that's a great point. And we know words matter, right? So I'm interested in the continuity and consistency in messaging. I know Lambda does, tries to break it down and say, okay, what this really is about is that Georgia Quality does the same thing, works, does a great job working with your organizations and saying what this really means for your group. I guess what I'm looking for is a place we can go that says these organizations are collaborating in the messaging, the right words, and here's how it affects corporations and our employees and their children. This is how it affects sports in our community. This is how it affects healthcare in our community, and really frame it in the way that we can all consistently talk about it uh, from an educated perspective versus this rhetoric that happens or the framing that's coming at us, right? So I don't know if we have a solution today, but I would love to see us have that common place where we can get the words right that we can all have. No, that's a, that, that, that's a very good point, and I, I, I guess there's so the, um, um, you know, so like the, uh, the other side uh, does a good job of educating their uh, you know, people who aren't making the decisions about, about what the language is by just repeating it over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, you know, so so um, and, 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 and it, 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 that has the benefit of not explaining that you don't have to explain the strategy or the rationale behind it. Which you know, it's exposed, it's exposed, you know. So you, 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 I mean, you, you, I mean, obviously, you know, if you can't, if you come up with a, you know, a, a great way of saying it, and you made a decision about that versus other things, you don't, you don't necessarily want to, you know, have, to have all your laundry out there in the, in the whole thought process. Uh, um, but, um, but, but, but we, we can do a lot better job of, um, of, 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 I think, that repetition that people can take their cues and, and know that they, yeah, this is the better, the better way to talk, to talk about it. But I, I think it's probably, I mean, the other, the other thing would be like if, uh, 
Uh, I mean, don't let the lab the, 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 the alien people lines get their patient. I mean, we, we, uh, I suppose it'd be working with that terms of just thinking out loud, but, but um, that, um, you know, having that, we, uh, like, look, keep, keep doing what they want to learn and make sure we're aligned with them, and then they can do those people for that too. Yeah, I'm looking at Darian and Aaron right now. Uh, I'm glad. <laughs> Look, what I think the issues of one of our roles and as we wrap up this conversation is my role for the I love it. I love it so much. Like, uh, you know, I, think, I think it's important. I think one of my charges at someone who's the Institute for is around messaging. And I'm going to actually be doing some listening uh, uh, conversations around the state to figure out like, what is that aligned messaging and how can we drive it home? And, and, and make sure that we're sort of having a counter message to some of the rhetoric that's out there now in advance, not so much in 2024, like we gotta get ready for 2025, because guess what? Whatever happens in the election in 2024, one thing that we didn't plan for in 2016 when I was here doing the conference and everyone was walking around like zombies, it was like a few days after Trump was elected, right? We didn't have a plan. There was no scenario planning. There was no, if this happens, then what? And I don't want that to ever happen again. So I think our organizations really have to come together, proactively think about messaging. Uh, you know, you have a comment there, and we'll, we'll close out. And I would say we should be thinking about 2030 and beyond. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, but then, Sam, just to your, your uh, question. Uh, there are some national organizations right now. Uh, so like all the national uh, LGBTQ-led boards are working collectively around some broad messaging. And so that is actually something that is like actively happening right now. Awesome. So I am going to take Gabrielle and the, the last question. I see your, see your hand. Yes, pull this out. I want to go and say, you know, the trans community is a very small community. And I have a lot of friends who are allies, both cis, straight, and gay. I'm a trans man. <laughs> That's not the best thing, you know. We'll say that. <laughs> what are my best friends? Yeah. But, but, but I think what, you know, with talkers come to and, and I think when we're talking about messaging, I would love to understand why should I care about this when it's not my own experience, right? I think from an advocacy perspective, we got to advocate for someone whose lived experience is different from our own. And until we get to that place, we're leaving people behind because the numbers just don't add up. So I guess when we're talking about messaging, I would love to hear the messaging around why should this not happen if it doesn't affect you? That, that's a good segue in my about talking to you and, and Darren about my work going into 2024 and he's listening to it because we have to have conversations in Macon and, and Columbus and all these other places around what is that messaging and a, a lot of times we're preaching to the product. We have the same players at the table uh, and I think the National Center for Social Human Rights has access to this broader tent of people that would call themselves human civil rights activists, but who haven't been the advocates that we need um, on behalf of trans people or on behalf of people that are not binary. So what does that what does that messaging look like? Uh, to really say that like, if you're saying you're on the side of human civil rights, but you're leaving this group of people out there that are contradicting. Right, and we have to be able to have those conversations. Yeah, we know that like Selma was a different sense of experience because there were white people in that bridge. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the same goes for the LGBTQ community that we, we have to do a lot of education and training for people that want to be allies and to see themselves as allies on how do they talk about these issues when they come up at dinner table conversations or at work and at the workplace. So uh, any comments uh, connected to what Gabriel said? I think plus one everything you just said. Um, um, and then I do think the is I think this is going back to the to us really thinking about like, you know, where the overlaps are. 
Um, and so I think there is a lot that we can have conversations about, and that's what the state says is the left. And that, that space that is about systems that have been created. And so I think that's really like the sweet spot. Because um, we're, we're all facing some form of oppression. And so how do we like talk about how our oppressions, you know, not to have a oppression party, but like <laughs> building out like the, the same folks who are like, you know, trying to oppress me or the same folks that are trying to oppress trans communities and other communities. Because, because on the other side of that, there are areas that you need to drive wedges between different communities yes. to say, oh, well, like, you know, you can't have <coughs> your right to be violated because black people are like, oh, well, you can't say this to me. Right. Like, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, exactly. So, really important work. I want to thank both of our panelists. So uh, thank you to you all uh, for being here. Uh, so some logistics uh, as we transition into our next part, uh, a couple of things. Um, one, we're going to go ahead and shut down our Facebook feed now, if you can go ahead and 